And if I can say the North Queensland Cowboys is my favourite non-education gig, let me tell you, they're very nice boys. Now, um, I was asked to come along today and speak about the tropical agenda, and I'm always very pleased to do that. The current debate does go to Northern Australia and what the potential is for Northern Australia, and I think you know, Peter's just done a fine job, and I know Keith will too, to speak about some particular aspects uh, of Northern Australia. I'm based in Northern Australia, um, as is Keith. I'm not quite sure about, uh, about Peter. Uh, but for us, this is personal. And there's an angle to Northern Australia which does go to the world of the tropics, the issues of the tropics that I want to draw to your attention today. If you have a look at the Coalition's discussion paper, and certainly in discussions with the previous government too, there was a strong understanding that in order to make the most of what we have as the potential in Northern Australia, it's really wise for us to think about not just the North in and of itself, and I don't suppose we'd ever do that, but it's also very important for us to think about the North in context. And that does go to the tropics. 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, Aristotle wrote that there are three zones of the world, the frigid zone, the temperate zone, and the torrid zone. He said that the only place, however, where civilised human beings could live was in the temperate zone. But I live in the torrid zone, along with, I would say right now in the world, more than 40% of the world's population, 55% of the world's children, a place that generates about 20% of gross world product, about 80% of the world's biodiversity, and some of the critical, most critical issues of our time, whether they're issues associated with health and disease, the development of governance structures, judicial, ju judicial structures, environmental management, all of this is playing out in the tropical world. Australia, and my definition of Northern Australia is a little bit more expansive uh, than Peter's, when I, I, I talk about the Tropic of Capricorn, and indeed that's, I guess, what a lot of people would um, position as Northern Australia. We're the developed country with the largest tropical landmass. We have scientific assets, including CSIRO, Ames, my own university, Charles Darwin University, the assets of other universities, as well as a very vibrant business community, uh, particularly the one that I know best in Northern Queensland, that is positioned to take advantage of the growth and development in the tropical world, because there is growth and development. I said more than 40% of the world's population. By 2050, the estimate is it'll be more than 50% of the world's population. And as I mentioned, the youth of the world um, is based in the tropics. There is a tremendous opportunity for us as a nation, uh, but I also think a tremendous obligation for us to think about the issues of the tropical world. Now, why do I get excited about this? I get excited about it because I believe it's objectively true that there is a, a fantastic opportunity and a way of reconceptualising, if you like, the role that Northern Australia and the rest of Australia, for that matter, might play. I also have a, a reason for concern about this that's closer to home that goes to my own university. Um, and uh, just to let you know, my own university, James Cook University, based in Cairns, Townsville in Singapore, um, is more than 50 years old now as an institution. It was the second oldest university in Queensland. We were the University of Queensland from 1960 to 1970 when we were fledged and, and let uh, go on our own way as an independent university. And the crucial thing is that if you look at some of the founding documents of that university, and indeed the State Act of Parliament that brought the university into being, that university was charged not only with providing educational opportunity and research of interest to people in northern Queensland, it was charged with another key objective, and it is evidenced in our Act, and we're to focus on education research on issues of importance to the peoples of the tropics, the peoples of the tropics. So we look north, east and west, and everything we do in our university focuses on the tropical world. And as people come to grips with the great opportunity, I believe, that Northern Australia represents, um, I think that that is integrally um, aligned with, it is connected to the future of the tropical world and realising the potential of assets in Northern Australia and what that might mean, not just for Australia overall, but indeed for the tropical world and beyond. The challenge for us is that um, we haven't viewed the world in this way, have we? we? We tend to think of the world as north, south, east, west, developed, developing. We haven't thought about that fundamental Aristotelian connect idea of the world, that concept of the world, that lateral idea. But when you do think about it, it makes a lot of sense to imagine that the geographic similarities, the climatic similarities around the world 
does provide a tremendous challenge, but opportunity as well for Australia, but for the remainder of the world. And so part of my ambition, and part of the reason why I was very happy to come along today and speak about the Northern Australia agenda, part of my ambition is to reprise that fundamental Aristotelian understanding of the world, really, probably, the, the oldest written way in which the world conceptualised itself, those three zones. The great challenge, however, in the context of the Northern Australian interest, the, the interest right now, which I understand for the development of Northern Australia for some populations, and certainly up my way, it's a long-held dream. For others, it's a hopeless fantasy. The challenge, I believe, for us is to reconceptualise Northern Australia, not just in and of itself, but rather as part of that tropical world. But in a world where we do consider the world north, south, east, west, develop, developing, OECD, non-OECD, all of the other dichotomies, um, uh, that first world, third world, all of those other dichotomies, how do we reprise this fundamental, uh, fundamentally Aristotelian conception? And so I want to share some news with you about that. A few years ago, in struggling with that very question, because by then, and, and being in my position, you'd understand that I'm totally convinced about the importance of both Northern Australia and more particularly the opportunities of the tropical world and the needs of the tropical world. I thought about how it is that we might be able to add another worldview to the way in which we conceptualise the world, and that is to raise the profile of the tropics. How do, we, how do we do that? So the idea developed in discussion at my university about developing a report, and the report is entitled The State of the Tropics. And the report has a very simple objective, and it is to answer what I think is a very simple but very profound question. Is life in the tropics getting better? Is life in the tropics getting better? Now, up until the end of 2006, I filled a role as the chairman of the Australian Statistics Advisory Council, advising the Australian statistician and federal cabinet on national statistical priorities. And when we had this idea, I rang the then, um, at, at my time, he'd retired by the time I rang him in the middle of 2010, uh, Dennis Truen, the former Australian statistician, I rang him and I said, Dennis, here's an idea for you, the idea of this report. Is life in the tropics getting better? Has it been done? And if it hasn't been done, can we do it? Because if we can't get valid and reliable data, you all would know, there's no point thinking much further about it. He went away. Um, he'd, been on, he'd been president of the International Statistics Institute on, the, on a board of the World Bank. I knew he was the man to find the answer to those questions. He came back to me and said, good news, Sandra. It hasn't been done, and yes, we can do it. So he and I wrote a concept paper and I sent it out just before Christmas 2010 to 11 of my equivalents around the world because my thinking is that if what we are doing, and it is a fundamentally geopolitical agenda here, we're wanting to do nothing less than changing the way the world views itself to realise those opportunities for Northern Australia and the tropical world. If this is what we're doing, it was far more important than a James Cook University project or a Queensland project or an Australian project. It seemed to me that I had to test the idea with other colleagues around the world to see whether or not there would be traction and take up on this. So we wrote this concept paper. I sent it out just before Christmas and it was like sending my baby out. By then I was totally convinced that we needed to do this. And fortunately, people were very enthusiastic. And what we did then um, with that positive response um, is Dennis and I wrote a discussion paper. I um, hosted the inaugural um, meeting of the International Leadership Group, which uh, all of the presidents or their equivalent vice chancellors were invited to participate in. And we went through that discussion paper, set the parameters for the project, and since then, the report is being prepared. Now, the report is almost finalised. Um, it goes to a number of lead indicators. You can think about what they might be. It certainly goes to education, it goes to environmental management, it goes to issues like corruption in governments, um, for example, um, health and disease, life expectancy. Uh, the report is almost complete. We have released already two early insights, one on life expectancy, because the lowest life expectancy in the world, not just in the tropical world, is Central and Southern Africa, and that was released out of our partner institution um, in uh, November 2012, and that uh, partner institution is the University of Nairobi. 
Then, uh, middle of last year, we released one on primary forest cover, which was released out of Costa Rica, the Organisation for Tropical Studies Field Station. We've got two more coming out, one on economic outputs and one on wild marine catch. And then at the end of June, early July, uh, we will have the worldwide release of the report and what we believe will be World Tropics Day. The point of this report is not simply to be a book of numbers. It really is to profile the tropical world, to test and identify where policies that appear to have improved, whether it's agricultural production or governance structures or health and disease, to test where policies appear to have worked and those that appear to have failed. Um, the, the report also includes a number of essays from experts so that you can see what you might be able to do with these data. The data are going to be available more broadly for people to utilise and to come to their own, um, the, to do their own analyses uh, with as well. So I guess what I should do is let you know that there are um, the, the 12 institutions um, that are a part of this, just so that you get a bit of an idea of this, and I'll save my use my last uh, few minutes to speak about Northern Australia and what I think this means for Northern Australia, but I'm sure you can imagine uh, what it might mean. Uh, the institutions are the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, which is the oldest school of tropical health and medicine in the world, the University of Nairobi that I'd already mentioned to you, uh, Mahidon University, which is an elite tropical health and medicine university in Thailand, uh, the National University of Singapore, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, James Cook University, which has led and initiated this, the University of Papua New Guinea, the University of South Pacific, which is based in, um, in Fiji, but works across um, the, the uh, South Pacific as well. Uh, the University of Hawaii, Manoa. There's an Ecuadorian politics and economics university. The Organisation for Tropical Studies, Secretariat at Duke University in North Carolina, but field station in Costa Rica. And also INPA, which is the Brazilian government's uh, major research institute on the Amazon. So those are the 12 partners uh, putting this together. It will be a, a major worldwide release, um, and we do have someone of winning international stature who is going to do that for us, and I have somebody uh, right now um, in country um, working with that person's people so that we can nail a date, and I hope by next week I'll have a specific date uh, for this. So what does it mean, this tropical agenda for Northern Australia? As I said, I do think part of the challenge for us is to break out of what I think sometimes is a very inward-looking idea of Northern Australia, and particularly perhaps from Point South. I'm originally from Melbourne, spent a number of years here, and I don't mean any disrespect um, at, at all. But I do think sometimes we, we put the development of Northern Australia in stark relief to where a lot of, where a lot of business is done in the South, uh, for example. And I just don't think we can afford to, to run that, around that paddock again. Uh, the fact of the matter is we have to think about Northern Australia in a new way. And I do think bringing to bear the opportunities in the tropical world um, is one way of us changing our mind about that and thinking perhaps rather more deeply but also rather more courageously about what Northern Australia might offer. When I speak to people, to businesses in Northern Australia uh, about the potential of the report and what that might do, not only is it aimed here politically to profile the tropics, to reprise that fundamental Aristotelian idea of the world, it will also reveal research gaps. It will reveal questions. It will reveal for policymakers, um, I think, a grounded understanding about what policies appear to have worked and what has failed. We can jump up learning curves. But potently, for business people, I believe it's going to demonstrate where there are new business opportunities in services delivery, for example, where there's an enormous appetite for health services delivery. So I do think that part of our challenge will be, uh, even as we think of commodity production and, and food production and, and other very energy, a number of other very important areas, we should be thinking about services innovation and the way in which some of our know-how in operating across, uh, and Peter's quite right, we do often operate east to west um, across the Tropic of Capricorn, thinking about how we operate and how we deliver services in a range of different environments and circumstances and how that might parlay, if you like, into economic opportunity um, given the growth of the tropical world. And it is growing. It's an important part of the world and it's one that we need to focus upon. I'll fin finish up by saying that uh, I've had the opportunity to brief um, many people around the world on the report, but on the tropical agenda more broadly, and I've published uh, on it as well. 
Um, people like uh, one of President Obama's four, former advisors, the Gates Foundation, um, many uh, bureaucrats and, and ministers and, and politicians and certainly our own Prime Minister, Minister for Trade, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Education are all alert to this. And it might be interesting for you to know that the group has never sought government funding to support this particular report. As I've said to um, many politicians, I don't want to have to care about what you care about. You know, we want to look at issues that we think are important, and so we've done this um, off our own bat. Uh, from my point of view, um, the challenge for us is to realise those opportunities. And if I can just share with you, one of my favourite conversations was had as I was discussing the report and its potential with um, a fellow from the Belgian Congo. Now, the Belgian Congo um, has a few challenges um, at the moment, and we don't have a francophone institution in our group, our international leadership group, and I'm, I, I feel that keenly, and, and I think we do need that, so I've been keeping in contact with some folk. Anyway, what he said to me was this. He said, Sandra, the reason why we and a number of his colleagues are so keen on this redefinition of the world, this, this new idea reprising this fu fundamental Aristotelian idea of the lateral nature of the world, is that in the past, when things have gone wrong for them, they've looked to New York, or Washington rather, or Brussels to help them get out of the spot. And whether or not the potential for those economies to assist in future it will be attenuated or not, I mean, I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows. But he said the key point is that oftentimes the solutions are not fit for purpose. He said, I would rather look to Singapore. I'd rather look to Hawaii. I'd rather look to Australia. I'd rather look to con construction now, services delivery now, um, from those jurisdictions rather than from traditional sources where oftentimes all the goodwill in the world simply does not equate to developing a solution to particular issues of the day. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for listening to me. Um, the tropical agenda, as I see it, is an essential part of Australia's development and the Australia to come. Thank you very much.